I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, the liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Sure. All righty. I would like to now introduce our board of directors. We have Cindy Coe, Madeline DeMaitinon, Tasha Woods, Kathy Day, and I'm Mike Rowley. We're also joined tonight by our superintendent, Troy Turno, executive director of teaching and learning, Jennifer Kuntz, executive director of finance and operations, Kim Snyder, and student representative, Amari Thorne. We also have another guest. And board, that takes us to our first item on our agenda, which is board recognition, swearing in. Okay, all right, <laughs> just double checking. So um, tonight we will be swearing in uh, Yutong Liang. And as a new student representative, I believe of the junior class. So Yutong, if you'll join me up at the microphone, that'd be great. Testing. All right. So if you can repeat after me, please. Okay. I, I, Yutong Liang, Yutong Liang, do affirm that I am a citizen, do affirm that I am a citizen of the United States of America, of the United States of America, and of the state of Washington, and of the state of Washington, that I will support the Constitution, that I will support the Constitution, and the laws of the United States, and the laws of the United States, and the Constitution and laws, and the Constitution and laws of the state of Washington, of the state of Washington, and will and will to the best of my judgment and will to the best of my judgment skill and ability skill and ability truly faithfully and diligently truly faithfully and diligently and impartially perform the duties and impartially perform the duties of Ellensburg school district of Ellensburg school district Student representative. Student representative. In and for Kittitas County. In and in Kittitas County. Washington. Washington. As such duties are prescribed by law. As such duties are prescribed by law. Thank you. Welcome to the board. All right, congratulations, Yutong. Welcome to the board. Uh, board, we do have another uh, recognition tonight, but uh, we're going to postpone it until they. You don't arrive. need a motion, huh? Okay, I thought you needed a motion. We're no. Oh, good. Nope. We're just going to postpone it until they arrive at a later time tonight. So. Uh, pardon me for one second. All right, board, first action item is the consent agenda. We've had the opportunity to review these items individually and seek clarification from the district admin prior to our meeting. I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the consent agenda. I second. Kathy is moved that we accept the consent agenda and Madeline is seconded. Board, any discussion? Call vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, consent agenda has passed and all right, board that takes us now into administration and first up student reports, Mari. All righty, so as of late, not too much has been happening at the high school since HOCO last happened, but you guys heard about that in the school improvement uh, plan presented by 
principal uh, Bo Snow, um, which has been great. Um, adding on to what he mentioned previously, club enrollment and student involvement in activities at school um, are extremely high in, compared, in comparison to years past, with most clubs that I've checked in with noting that they've noticed their membership being significantly higher than it has been in the past which I think is pretty wonderful to hear that a lot more students are choosing to become involved and to at least try and to, um, find ways to get involved in whatever ways that they can. Um, and so there's a lot of great news there. Um, orchestra, choir, and band are getting ready for their winter concerts. And I think choir just had their first concert yesterday, I believe, or two days ago. Um, um, but I heard that it was wonderful and that it was really great. And the fall play is um, going along very well from what I've heard. And for those of you all that don't know, we will be the first school um, in the state, I believe, to be performing this uh, version of Harry Potter. So it's pretty cool and pretty exciting. So um, that is, as of right now, the school update. Thank you, Omari. Troy? Should we have Yutong say a little bit? About yes, uh, so I told her she did not have to do a report, but she can definitely introduce herself and tell us she did a fantastic job in her interview. And so it'd be great if you could share a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Yutong Liang, and I'm a junior at EHS. Um, currently, I'm running cross country. I also do track in the fall or in the spring. I love running. I'm very involved at the school, which is why um, I came here. And I think it's going to be a great opportunity for me to express um, how our students are feeling at our school with the um, perspective that I see from all the activities that I'm involved in. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dong. Um, that now takes us to Jennifer and Jen and the teaching and learning update, please. Okay, just a couple of items on tonight's TNL update. I uh, was just going to mention that we've been talking about those leadership teams that we are putting together around a number of different areas. So those have gotten started. And um, the PLC one, the writing, the writing's actually already met twice um, since we last saw you. And the K-5 math adoption team has met, the 612 math leadership team and the ML multilingual leadership team have all uh, had their first meeting and those conversations are off to a great start. I think there's a lot of great momentum and a lot of voices at the table around these issues. So um, I'm excited to see what comes from them. Um, a quick update on digital media and AI literacy and citizenship since I just got back from the uh, Innovation Summit. Um, to be honest, that Innovation Summit wasn't groundbreaking for us in any way, but that was affirming because it let us know that while we have things to get in place, we've done some of that foundational work of shared knowledge around these things so that we are ready um, to get moving on some of the things. So those are just some bullets that you guys had mentioned as being of interest to you um, in particular. Uh, but we are having initial conversa conversations around looking at common sense media and implementation of that in our system so that we can point to specifically where in elementary or where in middle school do we have the digital media and AI literacy and citizenship occurring and being taught. Um, so I anticipate some real headway on that by the end of the way, end of the year for sure. Um, we are ready almost to launch some district guidance and some FAQs and some initial communications to families and staff around uh, the use of AI in Ellensburg School District. Um, but we are going to, last year we had an AI leadership team, so we're going to regather that team to review what we've put together for that guidance and FAQ and communication and get feedback on it before we send it out. Um, and then we also are um, looking at what tools to purchase specifically to address both uh, tools for teachers in um, helping them with some of their professional tasks and then that could also be a support for students. And I think all of the above addresses that issue of equal access, which I know is a concern of we don't want this to become the digital divide 2.0. Um, and so if we get tools in place that all students can access, 
Um, and if we have clear communication and instruction in our classrooms, then hopefully that helps mitigate the a, the potential for um, inequitable access. Um, and then lastly, uh, Joan had mentioned that she had thanked you guys for um, approving their out-of-state travel to a conference and that a couple of you had expressed interest in hearing how that went. And it made me think, yes, that, you know, as the board that approves that out-of-state travel, it's probably nice to hear every once in a while, whatever happens from those conferences and that learning and how do we implement that and how does that impact our system? So tonight uh, we've invited a couple of people to present on their out-of-state travel that you guys approved, um, conferences that they attended and what's happening uh, because of that. So we have Joan Smith and Maddie Petrie here to talk about theirs and Hope Isit and Jamie Moltine here to talk about theirs. Um, and I don't know who wants to go first. And Michelle's here too to talk about implementation about the math stuff, the building thinking classrooms, or just to be support. <laughs> John, will you turn on your microphone, please? I turned it back off. Sorry. Thanks, Mike. Um, we went to a training called Comprehensive Literacy for All, and it is um, starts with a book that Maddie and I discovered a few years ago um, that is dedicated to teaching students with the most significant needs how to read and write. The, that is what um, Miss Petrie and I are both tasked with doing. And we had the opportunity to go to Denver for three days and work with the authors of this book and some other experts in, um, in what is now commonplace. When I was first going through my education in the 80s <laughs> and 90s, uh, we were essentially taught that um, kids with significant disabilities probably won't ever learn to read. And if they haven't learned to read by the time they get to middle school and high school, that you should just stop trying. And that's what I did for many years because that's what I was taught was that this, these are um, students whose disabilities are so significant that they cannot learn how to read. And literacy in the world of special education has turned a complete circle and we now know that that's not true that people with significant disabilities can learn to read at any age mm -hmm. and that is what this entire training was about was that we are going to figure out the strategies that work implement the strategies that work and enable anybody to have access to text and the learning that comes, the learning and the enjoyment and pleasure that come from accessing text. Right, and uh, this Comprehensive Literacy for All training promotes a curriculum called Readtopia, and we have not had a huge pleasure in special education of even having curriculum. Uh, Joan taught me how to become a special ed teacher when I was in college, and the main thing she taught me was you have to figure it out as you go. And that's what I've done my first four years of teaching is just, oh, this kid has this IEP goal, so let me figure out how to teach them about this specific skill, and then we move forward. And we have the privilege of getting to use a curriculum that's not only research-backed, but we're already seeing growth in, what, eight weeks of school. Mm -hmm. um, I have students who are 17, 18, 19 years old who have never learned how to isolate sounds, blend and segment, never learned how to recognize the name of every letter, let alone the sound of every letter, decode CVC words. And I have students who are doing that now, and that's huge. I see growth like every five or six months in some of my high teens, early 20s students with significant impairments. And I'm seeing it in weeks now, and that's super exciting and encouraging as a special ed teacher. Um, one example of something that Retopia is telling us to do in the classroom is to eliminate symbol supported text. And for people who aren't familiar, students who aren't readers or who we think can't be readers have a sentence or word, for example, the word park, and then a picture of a park might have a kid sliding down a slide, a picture of a tree, a dog playing fetch, and then they look at the picture and try to guess what the word is based on the picture. So I'm going to tell you an example really quickly about a student of mine. We'll call him student K who is 18 years old and he's never been able to recognize the sounds or names of letters fully. Student K looks at a picture of a park and says things like swing, fetch, 
outside, trees, nature, and eventually with teacher support, we get to the word park and we say, congratulations, you read the word park. <laughs> student K didn't read the word park. <laughs> student K looked at a picture and guessed what the picture was. And then we just put a word next to it and said that he was reading. And that's not accurate at all. We've eliminated symbol supported text this year from both of our classrooms, kind of cold turkey. And I was really nervous about that because change can be scary. But student K, the same student, looks at the word park and he's still not reading park yet. But he says pizza, play, Play-Doh, pet. And with teacher help, he gets to the word park, but he's not guessing based on a picture, he's reading. He sees the P and he knows that P says P. And now he's guessing words that start with P. And I get goosebumps thinking about it because he's never done that before. And that's huge in our classrooms to see growth like that in such a short amount of time. And another thing that Retopia, this curriculum, Sorry tells us to do is provide the same opportunities with writing. I have been under the impression along with Joan that if our students aren't reading, how are we gonna facilitate writing when they have gross and fine motor skill deficits and they're not necessarily speaking with us with words. But we just give every kid, regardless of ability level, um, a piece of paper and a pencil and their AAC device and a scribe if they're not a speaker. And we tell them to write, be brave, tell me whatever you want because what you think is important. And then we sit with them afterward and they tell me, even though their, their page might look like some symbols that we with our naked eye don't recognize as words, they say, I went to the store with my mom and I bought ice cream. I jot it down on a little sticky note real quick and I stick it in their notebook so the next reader knows what this student is communicating. And they're becoming braver. And they're not asking me anymore, Miss Petrie, how do I spell what? I don't want to spell it wrong. Can you help me? Because I'm not making the mistake of sitting there and telling them they spelled it wrong and trying to correct them and making it spelled correctly when that's not the point. The point is not to spell the word what correctly. The point is to help them know that what they think matters and that I want to hear it. And that's been exciting and eye-opening. And I see my students growing and I'm not used to seeing it in that at that speed at 18, 19 years old. Yeah. The, the piece about phonics goes far beyond even reading when we talk about our kids who don't have speech and use augmentative communication. So they use an iPad with a program where they can select words and text in order to say what they need. And it's a wonderful, wonderful device. And there are thousands of words on there, but there's not an infinite number of words on there. So without kids having some ability to know letter sounds and, and attempt spelling, they're still limited by the words that are on that program. And there might be thousands and thousands of things that they want to say to us that aren't already programmed on their devices. So if we continue to work on this phonics and writing and expressing, then we know that as an adult, those people can communicate their thoughts, right. ideas, and needs in an even better way than just be limited to by what we think they might want to say on their device. So I have another example. I wasn't cool enough to have it on a PowerPoint slide. Um, but I don't know if you can see it. We darkened it. I don't know if I'm going I want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the people who were on the screen when we first started saying you're going to write and we're not going to do it. Okay, so he got some marks on there um, and he did this mostly with his head down, not wanting to look at us, not wanting to do this at all. And we just, like I said, we kept at it, we kept at it, we kept at it this in October of this year. And there's a date on there, and there are letters, and they look like letters, and they have meaning. This is his science notebook. And he is copying from the board, but he could never have copied from the board last year. Across the other side. And the biggest thing is, is now this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And so his mom has seen all of this, and this is like the best part. He's writing. So I know that by the time he gets to Matthew, <laughs> she's going to be even more. So we just really appreciate the opportunity that you gave us because while we were using concepts from the book, as much as we can, the three days of training has just completely changed what we do in both of our classrooms. And we're 
so excited to share it with student teachers and our para pros mm -hmm. and, and everybody. We so. both have student teachers right now and they're both just as excited as we are. And you can see the trickle happen from a source and it just goes out and it's super exciting. So we appreciate it. And thank you guys for supporting us. Thank you. Or do you have any questions or would you like I want to thank you. Um, this is the, an example of professionalism that we're hoping, right? So you found the, the conference, you found the book, uh, you were brave enough to change practices and what you've been told in the 80s, I guess that's what you mentioned, um, right? But it was you, right? That was you and you were brave enough to do that and you were kind enough to show us and to share with us and that ripple just continues. And that is professionalism and thank you for being a teacher in our district doing that. Yeah, just to reiterate what Tasha said, and if you can, at some point, maybe bring some of the kids, and, you know, let us hear from them, too. I think that'd be, it's, it's amazing. So good job. Thank you. Oh, student K would be a blast. <laughs> <laughs> He's a ham. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Joan and Maddie, very much for coming and talking to us so and sharing with us. Hope and Jamie, you guys are up Do you have next. Do PowerPoint that I sent you? I sent it to you too. I shared it. I shared it with you yesterday. I believe. So while you're while you're somebody's looking for that. <laughs> Technology. So um, I just wanted to be able to kick this off for this team. I didn't know that this other fabulous, fabulous duo was going to present, but it is really a testament to how important it is um, that we get our teachers this kind of support and this kind of professional development because it is making a huge difference in our district. And so I can share that how proud I am of uh, Joan and Maddie because I've seen that in action as well, but also our sixth grade math team is, it is so cool right now. It is so cool to see what's happening in the classroom and to see kids engaging on a really deep level with math thinking. And so I just wanted to say uh, from an administrative perspective that that permission to let them go um, to that conference really does make a huge impact on a lot of kids. And it is having already um, a great impact on our on their colleagues as well. So uh, Jamie Multine and Hope Isaac. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I'm here to thank you for letting them go because I didn't actually get to go to the conference, but um, it's been really helpful to have that firsthand knowledge. And um, we, we found this book, I, I can't remember if it was brought by Rhonda or by um, Don Sparks, but it was brought to the K-12 math team last year. And which I also was not on last year, um, but they brought it back to our building and uh, and I had to get a copy because it's an amazing book. And so we've we've um, dove into it and um, yeah, and it's just been, a, it's had an amazing impact already and we'll tell you a little more about it, but. Go to the next slide. So the way that it kind of went is we started reading the book um, and talking about it and sharing ideas. And then I think Stephanie found the conference. Stephanie's really good at that. And that's Stephanie there. And that's us having our fan moment with Peter Lilladal, who's the book author. We waited in line so we could get him to sign our book and everything. Um, but when we went to Arizona, I think it's interesting to hear these guys talk first because it was a really similar experience for us. You know, we'd been reading, we'd been talking. I had... 50 pages with the corner turned down with things that I was wondering about and questions that I had. And when we were able to go there and hear multiple sessions from Peter himself and hear about his perspective being in the classrooms and um, his takeaways, it was it just changed everything. It really made it um, more real and kind of answered all of our questions. And I think something that I really wanted to say in coming here that I appreciate so much about this opportunity is that I've had other opportunities and I had all these ideas and strategies and things that I'd been trying from, you know, Stanford or the University of Washington or all of these kinds of things. But what they're doing in the Building Thinking Classrooms books, but really in their research, is they're looking at students and how do students behave in the classroom and what is it that they're doing 
How are they thinking? They're asking students those questions. And then they're giving us all of this tons of data so that we can change our practice based on the student experience. And I feel like I haven't really seen that before and it just kind of brought everything together. So that's been really cool. So these are some graphics from the book that really were striking to us. Um, especially that first one to me that um, Peter did a bunch of research. He went into a lot of classrooms and just watched the more traditional uh, math classroom, the, you know, sit down, take notes. And then the, I do, we do, you do model um, gradual release kind of thing. And, and what he noticed is that, um, you know, more than 50%, and these are probably your, your best kids are, doing mimicking at best, right? Like all they're doing is then repeating and regurgitating what you've taught them, but the brain is not engaged and they're not thinking deeply and figuring out conceptually why math works and why math is what it is and why it's the language of the world, right? And then you have the kids who are faking it, the kids who are doing, you know, stalling techniques um, or just not doing anything at all, you know, and then those other kids who are like, I'm going to really try it and dig in. But that portion is usually pretty small. And um, and so we're trying to change those techniques. I, I really something that they said, like. It's really the technique of getting out of the way so the learning can happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really trying to do. And then the second graph, I know it's probably hard for you to see, but that was another one that we have, we talk about it all the time. The first three um, items on there are talking about how quickly kids will engage and get started on things. And the difference between how students, how quickly they will start working when they have, um, uh, paper and pencil versus a vertical whiteboard, which is what we use, um, is pretty striking. Um, the amount of time they spend on task is higher. And then the bottom part shifts, and we still are struggling with exactly what the 3.0 and the 2.8 mean, but it's clear um, that the, that vertical whiteboard is better for student learning on all measures. And again, it was things that they asked them um, and things like knowledge mobility. In other words, how can we take this and apply it somewhere else? So we, you can now see a couple of pictures of students working. We both now have 10 whiteboard stations on our walls, which is not easy to fit into the classrooms that we have, but we made it work. We've been very creative in, in setting that up. And um, every day our students are out of their seats in groups. They're um, this when we're measuring each other. That's what they're doing. Somebody, yeah. that looked funny. I thought it was cute that they were measuring. Um, the other one of the other big things about the building thinking classrooms model is random grouping, which is um, a hard sell. Sometimes kids don't love it, um, but we do true ran and it needs to be visible so they can see my kids draw marbles, his kids draw cards, cards. Mm -hmm. um, true random grouping. And the thing that I've noticed about it, um, there's a lot of benefits, but one of them is um, a kind of unintentional or maybe it's intentional and Peter just didn't tell me yet. Um, focus on equity. And, and power equalization in the classroom, because when you have kids select their own groups, they tend to, well, it says right there, they're either gonna be the follower or the leader, not necessarily thinking about whether they're gonna be a thinker. And when it's random grouping, they, they can't really do that. It's just who you're gonna get today. We're all working on the same task and, um, and how can we kind of support each other in doing that, so. Yeah, and we've made some norms and expectations for them, um, and these are in line with the book. And one really important thing is that only, there's only one marker. So there's groups of two or three, but they only have one marker. And so, um, and what we're really pressing for is that if you're doing the thinking, you don't have the marker. So you're passing that off because our goal is to create students that can communicate their ideas from their head, not just answer something correctly, right? But to be able to go out in the world and speak their truth to other people. And so we really want them to be trying to get that idea from them through someone else onto that board. Um, and that's been a big main focus of, of this year. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
And so this is another one um, that's a little bit interesting, um, but I think super powerful. And um, at the conference, they talked about this a lot because sometimes when people are reading the book and it says, don't answer questions, which is kind of what it says, but not really, they people think, oh, okay, so you know, Jamie asked a question and I just walk away. It's not, not, not what we're talking about. <laughs> um, so what it really means is that we're maybe um, answering a question with another question or um, leading them to some different thinking, um, encouraging them maybe to go look at what other people are doing. We do spies and things like that so they can go out and look and see what other people are doing and bring those ideas back to their group. Um, and I think it's interesting, the, the quote that we had there, that it's really important that children feel like they're heard, but in his research, he found that it didn't matter so much if they were answered. They just wanted their question to be heard and acknowledged um, and they could be encouraged to keep trying, so. Yeah, it's been pretty cool. Um, I, neither one of us have done any lecturing. I've barely been up in front of my class the entire year. The kids have been out of their seats doing the work themselves. We present them with problems mm -hmm. and they they go to work on it and they have to figure it out. And we just get to wander around and have amazing conversations with students and um, challenge them to continue to think deeper um, and to push their ideas. Um, when kids do get answers, I'm always challenging them to prove it or prove it in another way or prove it in a third way. How can you turn it into a picture? How can you, you know, provide more evidence so that it's not just I'm done. And then they're also learning really quickly that it's not a, can you check my work anymore? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not going to tell them if it's right or wrong necessarily. I'm going to say, did you prove it? Does it make sense to you? Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to answer me on that and figure out if it's right or if it's not right, because that's how they're going to like use their brain and, and learn. <laughs> and use their brain in, in the real world too. Yeah. So, yeah. Is that it? No, I think mm, one. Yeah. So um, note taking is a big deal in math. And um, I think it's a hard idea for um, people to release, but a lot of the research that Peter and his group have been doing is about what note taking means to children. And unfortunately, what he has found is that note taking doesn't really mean anything to children um, for the, the main reason that they can't think while they're taking notes. So they're just copying and sometimes they often will say that they can't keep up. So they're scrambling to keep up and they're copying, but there's no thinking that's happening while they're doing that. And so then it's really hard for them to go back and look at it because they don't even really know what it is because they weren't thinking while they were doing it. So the big piece here, because obviously we're not just giving them random tasks to do, you know, the tasks are all, we're trying to get to certain points and get to certain math and work on certain things. And then how do we consolidate that and bring that together? And um, we're still working on this. This is a challenging one to figure out how to do it so that it's authentic and real for them. Um, but I think we're making really good progress already. I keep thinking it's only the eighth week of school. And we're already, just like these guys, we're already seeing amazing stuff out of kids who maybe earned a one on the Smarter Balance last spring. And they're sharing and you know leading in the class. So mm -hmm. this is a piece that we're working on. Um, and these are, you know, I mean, they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it's cool to see. Yeah, it's a cool concept of instead of trying to prefront uh, everything, it's it's a reactionary thing, right? So it's a response. Now, what's your thinking? Now, let's capture it. You've been calling it letters to your future forgetful self. Yeah, I know that's something that's in the book too. But you know, we talk about that. It's like, how are we going to remember this? Because we all forget things. You know? And I so. and I wish Stephanie could be here tonight. She couldn't, but. She always, uh, she says to me almost every day, you know, who, who is this for and who's doing the thinking? Mm -hmm. And that's really what this is about. So, yeah. All right. Last slide. What's next? Um, we took this information to the 612 math committee. Um, and I was pretty frank about how I've been teaching for 34 years. And this is probably the most impactful thing that I've ever done in my career. And it is making a difference. And I think you all should be doing it is pretty much what we said. So, <laughs> um, and we have sixth grade math night tomorrow night. We have over a hundred people um, RSVP to come to math night at um, Morgan. So we're pretty excited about that. We've heard you've been invited. So if you can. Welcome, come, you're welcome. Come on down. 
check out a task. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, colleagues are curious and interested and they want to learn more. And I have to say, now that we're having the kids stand up all the time, I don't think they're going to be super excited about sitting down next year. So everybody's going to have to get them standing up. Sure. Um, and they're really improving. So we're excited and we appreciate very much the opportunity to be able to do this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Question, any questions? questions? <laughs> I do have a question for you guys. Actually, I have a question for both presentations because I thought, thought of this afterwards. Um, do you have like, because you went to the presentation and you've got the literature to learn from and to try and draw information for teaching and stuff like that, do you have access to follow up, getting back like, let's say you're looking at the book and you're like, wait, I don't understand how he to do this. He just sent Peter two emails today. Okay. Oh. So, I mean, we have like... But he asked me to, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I went on the BTC website. Uh, Stephanie's really connected with message boards and things like that. And I had gone on to ask a question and Peter emailed me back himself and said, uh, invited me to, you know, keep the conversation going. So, I think we do have that. But the questions are never ending. I don't know how these guys feel. Um and I would love to be able to go to a similar conference again. It's in Seattle next year. I'm not ask, asking necessarily, but just to have the opportunity to keep that conversation going or maybe meet with other schools that are doing it, that kind of thing. We do. We have, uh, they have made a portal mm -hmm. at the training of all the information in the training. And there's a discussion board at the bottom of that. And I actually have asked some questions recently that I haven't quite got answered, but it, it does benefit. So we do have access to uh, lots of materials. We have, I think, three in that with three Zoom so far this school year with the people from Reading Columbia our curriculum. They check in with us monthly almost via email, checking how things are going, ask continual questions because a lot of things are still really new in development too. I have a question uh, also, and I, I, this is related to thinking classrooms and how you're sharing that information with parents. I mean, this is so different from how they learned math in school. Mm -hmm. And so what conversations you're having or what kind of um, uh, supports you're offering them to really have those kind of conversations at home? So we're, we are, that's why we're doing tomorrow night. Um, and we kind of wanted to see how that's going. I've been trying to send home some parent square things and some, you know, pictures of kind of what it looks like, just because I know my kids would always, you know, what'd you do at school? Nothing, those kinds of things. Um, but I, I think that that piece, um, the building thinking classrooms research is relatively new. And it was talked about at the conference that that parent bringing parents in um, is a piece that is a little bit missing and just how to do that. Um, so I think we've been talking about that and, and just ways to do it more. Um, well, I know that's why we're doing the math now. I mean, Im yeah. immediately, the first thing you guys said to me this year was, we got to have a parent night. Right. We got to show them, have them do a task, mm -hmm. and we're not going to tell them about it. They're going to do it. Right. You know, so it's just going to be come in and experience what your kids do in math class, because this is how we're doing it, and we want you to know about it. So. Yeah, and it is really different, and I think, I think it's scary for some kids and for some parents, um, and so... I, I hope people will ask and that if we keep putting it out there, that they'll ask to have those conversations because we would like to have those conversations. Yeah. Um, as a parent who gets those parent squares, it is new and it, the math's not new, but getting the parent square information is new and awesome and keeps them coming. It's great. Uh, and you always encourage us to ask our children. So just as someone who just so happens to have a child in your room, uh, that's been really great. Uh, separately, I just want to say, uh, as simple as it might say, thinking classroom, and we can assume that thinking's happening in classrooms, sometimes we've gotten in trouble with that. And so, again, this is bold professionalism coming forward, where even your own room and the physical structure of the traditional building was sort of a hamper. You had to think about how to put those whiteboards up and what to do, and how it, it was, your comment, I think, was, I'm not in front of the room. Yeah. Right, the kids are asking questions, and that is um, so incredible. And also with the very loud math wars, that seem to be the loudest ones that go on in curriculum. Um, thank you for taking this step, and thank you for your word of being frank, because the kids aren't going to want to sit down next year. So thank you for that. All right. Thanks, thanks Jamie. Thanks, Hope. All right, board, that takes us into our business section of tonight. 
And first up, superintendent. Sorry, yes, we do. Sorry, Troy. <laughs> no problem. Seconds. I'm just. Hey. Troy, good. It's good. <laughs> your superintendent update, please. All right. So, uh, um, just our standard, we have heard nothing back from uh, DOJ at this point. We'll let you know as soon as we do. Um, a strategic planning process. So, uh, Bill and uh, Linda went to uh, the AI conference over the weekend, the same place. So, they got back to us, so we'll, we'll schedule um, a debrief and planning session with them, um, giving us some homework uh, with uh, some of the data that was collected uh, around the vision statement and, and some of those other uh, portrait of graduate stuff. So I just got that, so we'll wade through that and we'll, we'll get working on planning for that uh, next session. Okay, lastly, so here's kind of the majority uh, topic for the night. So I want to give you a really good update on what we've been doing with our ESD 105 Legislative Coalition. Uh, we ESD 105 superintendents have always been some of the most active uh, in working with the legislature, but uh, last spring and uh, early, the fall right off the bat, we decided this year to... Um, be even more targeted. So there's uh, a smaller group of us that are regularly involved with this. Um, and so Shane and Tom, uh, there's a superintendent from ESD 105, Shane Backlund, Tom Fleming, uh, the CFO, uh, have helped organize these along with uh, Melissa Gomboski, uh, who is our lobbyist uh, that ESD 105 has a contract with and, and has had for years. And so Melissa is incredibly connected, her company, we also have a Nora Burns supports us um, and a few others. And so collectively, we have uh, worked out a strategy and, and we just sort of completed our first phase of that. Uh, and we have superintendents, a uh, small group, but represent each one of the counties in ESD 105. So I represent Kittitas County, uh, Roger from Royal, represents Grant County, um, Kurt from Mount Adams, and Brian from uh, Granger represent Yakima County, and then uh, Ellen uh, represents Click Attack County in Goldendale. So we have a, a wide uh, geographic area in ESD 105. Uh, we have very large, you know, a large district in Yakima who really um, has their own legislative agenda and people and, and work with that. And then we have those of us that are sort of more medium sized to smaller. So uh, the main purpose is to really promote the the big three platform that WASA, WASDA, WASBO, probably AWSP and who, ever, there's probably some other alphabet organizations. Uh, but that's also our focus is to also uh, follow along with that strategy that WASA and WASDA helped organize which is to come up with the, the big three platform and to stay on message. Uh, each one of the 300 districts in the state of Washington, we all have our own financial story. We all have you know, a variety of things going on. Um, and so it can be very confusing for legislators to um, hear about all of those competing um, ideas and, and competing needs, when the reality is there are some very important things that we all need. So um, the big three uh, le uh, from the legislative platform, and, and we'll definitely hear about it at WASDA, uh, are MSOC, which is maintenance, supplies, and operating costs. There are nine categories uh, of funding for maintenance, supply, and operating costs. So that uh, is one of the, the big three that's really important, and special education, fully funding special education. Uh, those are things that have been, uh, special education has been on the table for a long time. We've made progress, but we're still not there. And then across the state, transportation is an issue. Now, in ESC 105, uh, the, the redefining the transportation legislation would not help many. It, it wouldn't do really anything for us uh, in Ellensburg, uh, and it wouldn't do much for many of the districts in 105. But there are other areas in the state where uh, the change in, in the um, funding formula would be very impactful. So those are kind of the big three. We honestly, the superintendents in 105 last spring, we were not super excited with that because we know there's a big missing piece and that is uh, changing the, Mc the McClary formula for funding teachers. Um, but they were also hearing uh, and it, Dan Steele represents WASA uh, as, you know, the main, the political legislative liaison. 
uh, Melissa was telling us the same thing. Everybody was saying, you know, yeah, we kind of, the legislature was telling them, yeah, that's kind of a problem. We know it, but we're not going to do anything about it right now. So that one went off the table. So we all had to kind of figure out what we were going to do. We still wanted to push it. Uh, so we really, though, ended up in our region settling on um, promoting the big three, but really emphasizing MSOC. And then one thing that's not a part of the big three, knowing that we're probably not going to get a lot of relief this year, but we do need to talk about that, and that is substitute costs. So uh, when we meet with legislators, we are focusing on you know, promoting the big three. Uh, we let them know that transportation is not a hot button issue for our region, but we fully support changing the model so all districts uh, can be healthy with transportation. So we talk about MSOC, uh, we, we talk about special education, but they already have a very good idea. They don't need a lot of education on special education. It's just whether they wanna to commit to the funding or not. Uh, but we also talk about substitute funding. So for example, um, all of our uh, full-time employees uh, by law are given 12 sick days per year. The state only funds four. Now we know when we negotiate personal days in the calendar that we've got to pay for that out of our levy. Like we, we know that that's a part of the negotiation process, but we're not funded for that sick leave. Uh, and now with uh, the changes in the law uh, for paid family medical leave, both the state program and the federal program, and the, the fact that staff has the ability to stack that together. So some people are, are able to take, um, you know, weeks and weeks off as part of that law. We get that, that all comes out of our levy. All, paying for those subs all comes, are, they're all local costs. So we've been raising the issue with legislators to help them understand that yeah, four days that's been around since, uh, and I forget now I was gonna write it down. Senator Wellman told us how long that's been on the books, a long time. We're, coming up on like two decades of without changing that formula. So uh, so we talk about that with them. Um, generally what happens, uh, just kind of the cadence we've we've fallen into is I, I handle the MSOC discussion. Uh, and it's been very interesting because uh, legislators first became legislators first became interested when they started to hear about uh, our insurance costs. And so, for example, just in the last two years, um, our insurance costs have gone up a little over, combined a little over $200,000. It's like two hundred twenty, dollars or that's not a little over, it's significantly over $200,000, like $220,000, just in the last two years, right? And MSOC hasn't kept up you know, with that. Um, but we also want to emphasize that uh, inflation has impacted all of our MSOC categories. So we, we really talk with the legislators about that. It isn't just about insurance. That's the most dramatic one where we can talk about our utility costs across the state going up an average of 40% over the last uh, four or five years. So we um, are really have been educating them about all of the different things because MSOC, there, there's a lot, you know, a lot of different things that go in there. Uh, and so it's been really interesting conversations and we've been able to share our stories and I will, I share our story in terms of, you know, we are a, a levy dependent district. We have a, our community supports our levy. Uh, and so what's really helpful for us in increasing MSOC and the bill that we are proposing and we have sponsors uh, and Melissa told us there's, there's pretty much sponsors lined up. Um, from both the majority and minority parties in both the House and the Senate uh, to add an inflationary factor so we don't have to keep coming back, right? And, and we can kind of figure that out. So we, we explain that to them, uh, but then I'll, we also share, so I can share our story and then we share our like the story from Mount Adams School District, which is geographically huge. Um, I, for, uh, I forget the number now. They have 900 and some students and seven uh and over 700 of them are native, uh, you know, live on, on the reservation. And so most of their land is actually tied up in the, the trusts, uh, the, the federal trust. So they don't get uh, much support and, they, and they, they really don't have the property value to really even generate much levy dollars when they pass it. So, so Kurt has a little different story than us, but we all have the same impact, you know, that. that. So we spent a lot of time with that. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you, uh, all the legislators, and I'll show you the list of who we met with over our phase one here over the last two weeks, 
have been really, really good listeners, um, and they've just done a fantastic job. They've asked great questions, uh, and so it's it's really been positive uh, all the way. Um, however, they're giving us the real the realistic story, which is right now the legislature is really, really um, concerned with their current and future revenue forecasts. We've gone through an extended period of time where those revenue forecasts were consistently positive and above what was expected. And that basically died last spring. <laughs> um, where we're, you know, where the state projected eight to nine percent growth for you know eight or nine years, we're we're at about two to three percent growth in revenue, which does not cover the maintenance level costs. And and so um Representative Ormsby, who is the budget writer for the uh, Democrats in the in the House of Representatives, uh, he he made sure that we understood uh, that maintenance level is their north star, and that's where they start with uh, and, and work work off of that. So. Um, they've had a lot of discussions and of course they have to wait uh, to find out what happens with the initiatives uh, that are on the ballot because that will have a, a significant impact uh, in money um, one of them directly money most of it goes to education so that's what they've sort of been banking on uh, we're at about a minimum three uh, billion dollars out of a 70 right now a 71 billion dollar budget we're about three billion in the state short on a revenue forecasts now that's also within a sort of more normal margin of error. But if certain things happen, it could get to eight to nine billion. And then that would actually uh, trigger some some serious stuff. So we've really just had some good deep dive conversations. And one of the things we've asked them is, what is it that you want us to know about your job and what you're doing? And th that's really led to some really good stuff. Um, but I will say, the thing that has made us uh, in the superintendent world extremely happy is their willingness to have already begun to educate themselves on MSOC and especially the ones on the education committees and some of the others uh, representatives in our region that you know are not on the education committees have been hearing enough about it that they've been asking around and they've been asking questions and uh, almost all of them said they just never really understood how important that MSOC formula was. And it's just not something we've talked about really before. And so they understand that it's important. So that's been really, really positive for us. Um, and I think we've established some good relationships. We have a, a second phase that's going to go on where we go and visit and, uh, as the session picks up. There's not a lot happening right now until the election. And then post-election, when we see how everything shakes out, there'll be another round as we go. So uh, final slide, please, Leslie. So these are, are the people that we've met with over the last uh, couple of weeks. And so um, we've met with our 13th district representatives, uh, Abara and Dent, uh, and then Senator Warnick. And those are the committees that they're on. Uh, Representative Dent was very, um, he had not done a deep dive into MSOC, so we spent some time explaining it. Uh, but he was very, very interested in it when we talked about the fact that just for example, that's over two hundred two hundred twenty thousand dollars that over the last two years are have increased insurance costs without any extra funding coming our way, that that's taken out of our local funds. And so then what we're trying to do to get MSOC is to be able to buy back our local funds, to be able to spend it and direct it on what we're working on and, and shared some of our, our things that we would like to spend that money on. Uh, and he's very... Um, very concerned with students uh, that are coming to us that have been through trauma or in the foster system or things like that. And we talked about how our levy funds really should be used to help develop support that. So he became very, very interested in it. Uh, Senator Warnick had taken some time to educate herself. She'd been hearing the stories. Uh, she was mostly concerned with insurance. So we had to talk a little bit about other aspects of it. Um, Representative Monica Stonier, so she is the majority leader uh, in the House of Representatives, and she is the only uh, Washington State legislator that currently works in education. She is an instructional coach in the Evergreen School District uh, near Vancouver. And she, uh, obviously, I didn't waste her time and explain MSOC to her. Uh, we just talked about it. So, uh, but she is a huge advocate, obviously, for public education. And she shared a, a lot of ideas. She shared a lot of the conversations that she's having. So that was a really productive conversation um, because none of us had really met her before. And so it, it, it was good. 
Um, Senator Wellman is one of the great champions and has been for a long time in the legislature. She travels to Eastern Washington an awful lot. Uh, she's from Mercer Island, but she she doesn't just take the Puget Sound uh, approach to things. And so she's asking questions. And she she really also, we did not waste her time with MSOC. She has been doing a deep dive, but she also said, I've been doing this a long time, and this is really the first time we've ever really cared about it um, because we've always been working on these other issues. Uh, so that was a, a really, really good conversation. Uh, she's also um, very much into early learning, so we had some really good discussions uh, about that. Uh, Representative Tim Ormsby from Spokane area, he is the chair of the Appropriations Committee. He has the purse strings, <laughs> he, and, and we knew not to ask him for money. Uh, Melissa told us, don't talk about the funding we need. Let's just talk with him about our concerns and programs and then let him tell us. And so we really, really had a good conversation with him and his you know, thought process as he works to develop a budget and, and how it goes. And, and so he was definitely appreciative that we did not ask for anything. We just talked about what our needs are and things like that. So a really good conversation. And then uh, Representative Steve Berquist, uh, Education Appropriations uh, Vice Chair. Uh, that was our last meeting yesterday. I had to um, travel for medical issues, my dad, so I missed that meeting. Uh, but was uh, the report that I got that it went just as well as all of the others, and he was also very forthcoming about the, the budget challenges, but what their priorities are. And interestingly enough, one of the things we talked to them about was the fact that after the McCleary decision, um, the state budget was about 53% K-12 education, and it's down to about 42% right now. And so, I mean, that's, that seems like a really powerful talking point, uh, but they also explained to us how relative that is uh, because there's been a lot of other money that's come in and expanded. And, and so they really talked about how, yes, they would like to achieve a better balance, but we're able to explain kind of how that happened. And one of the most important things uh, that came out of that um, discussion was uh, how the recognition coming out of the pandemic um, how much other support was needed and so how they needed to build and, and are going to continue to need to build support systems throughout the other parts uh, of the government that coincide with the challenges that our students are coming with um, and to create better connections uh, for um, services and, and things like that. So that's a part of their strategies. That was good for us to know, uh, good for us to hear. So um, I'm looking forward to, I mean, it's been a lot over the last couple of weeks. Um, with them, but we're very anxious as we then plan our second phase and what we're doing, uh, but we established some really good relationships and uh, they were able to, and they almost were universal, almost all of them, uh, mentioned that this is the first time they've ever heard education being focused and together and having the same message. We also have a lot uh, of ideas floating around. There's gonna be two really big bills introduced on special education. They kind of take different approaches. Um, people asked our opinion. I said, you know, in Ellensburg, it's not really about raising the, the cap because we're already under that. What it is is about changing the formula, uh, the funding to support that, and also to give us some different options for our most high need kids and things like that. So they asked really, really pertinent questions about like, this is what we want to do. What do you think? So it was really good. So that, that's been, a, like I said, it's been a, a push over the last couple of weeks to meet with all of them, but uh, I think our region has uh, made the impact that we hope for and will continue to do that. Any questions? All right. All right, no right. questions. Thanks. Thank you, Troy. <laughs> and thanks for all the work you're doing with the representatives and senators and trying to get the district everything they need. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Um, let's see. Before we go into business, we had one item on board recognition. And if uh, our administrators there in the audience don't mind, I think we'll go ahead and take care of them because it looks like everybody is here as they were walking in during Troy's update. Um, Ellensburg Cross Country Train. Um, do you have a dedicated speaker or is there a plan you guys can step up to the microphone and we'd love to hear from you guys
Just gonna raise it real quick. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, my name is Mariana Crosby, and I am one of the captains on the Ellensburg High School cross country team. So one of the big parts of us as a cross country team um, is our three C's. Um, so we have these overarching um, standards, um, and basically we narrowed it down into these three words that represent us. So this is character, commitment, and community. And so those kind of represent um, us as a team. Um, so then I have a couple numbers for us. So um, in cross country, um, all athletes, um, JV and varsity, are always running in every single race. Um, there is no one who's sitting the bench. Um, that's one of the wonderful things about cross country. Um, so we have 110 athletes on cross country this year um, from all four grades. Um, and that is 12% of our school population. Um, or yeah, 12%. Um, so it's just a huge program that is um, just, yeah, very big in our um, uh, school. So um, another um, important part, so we have four coaches and um, half of them are volunteers from our community. Um, so as well in um, cross, cross country, so speed is not important. Um, it's more for us focusing on living out those three C's in our daily life, but also in cross country. So pass it on. Hello, thank you so much for having the team wave. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to you. Um, so like Mariana said, our team is large. Um, it has the biggest participation in our fall sports, um, covering a third of its enrollment. And within our large community, we not only show our athleticism, but also our academic um, excellence. The girls team has won every district meet over the last 10 years, and we've placed um, on podium at state for many of those. Um, and then also... Like Mariana was saying, for all of um, our JV and our varsity team, we don't leave anybody out, and um, our JV runners perform at a level that could, without a doubt, have a spot on varsity on any team um, in the district. And then on the academic side, just last year, our boys team was academic state champion, highlighting our um, recognizability in both areas. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Kasser. I'm also one of the captains. And one thing I do want to emphasize is a, a community, more specifically community service. We do have a lot of people here and we do care about our community. And one of the ways we do that is how we serve the community. A um, good way example is that during the summer, we've uh, sent small group teams to Olympic trials down Eugene. We did Cascade Crest, which is helping out a hundred mile race. We had an eight station we set up there. And even today, uh, we had uh, clean up some people need a varsity layer. Uh, one, one of the ways to get varsity layer is how you clean up, uh, do community service. So we cleaned up some trash and helped get time, uh, get a varsity letter and and the way we help that community also helps us us because earlier earlier September we had a fundraising for one week and we were able to, re, to raise about six thousand dollars, and and that is very helpful for us as it helps us pay for things to this food and equipment. And tomorrow, tomorrow is one of our home meets at Rotary Park. I I like to extend my invitation to we we like to send our invitation to you guys to join us. Uh, we also have our senior night it starts at 3.30. The girls' race will start at 4.30, and the boys' race will continue right afterwards. I have some cards to give you guys. I will give in just a moment. But again, I want to thank I want to thank you guys for you know having us be here and having us speak on this, having us have a voice in what happens with you guys to make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> is this the last meet of the season before districts and state just cross country i assume cross country does districts and state right this is our last uh league meet and districts will be next saturday in yakima apple ridge so this is our last home meet and our last race this is uh not districts
and if somebody wants to answer this for me too, how long are your races? Three-ish miles. Five. Sorry, what was that? Three-ish miles. Three-ish miles? It's okay. Five kilometers. Five K? Okay. <laughs> I'm not a distance runner, so I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Board. Should I say anything? I'm just impressed with how many of you there are that actually enjoy running. Um, and when you said that speed doesn't count, I thought, yeah, maybe I could have done that. Yeah, if it didn't matter how fast it was. But um, just uh, I'm impressed and uh, well done because, you know, being fit physically is so important. And I'm afraid sometime maybe it's a little bit overlooked. Um, so in the you, you seem to have a tremendous camaraderie and uh, commitment to one another. So thank you for taking the time in your busy day to run out here. And, and talk to us. And most of you guys do regular track too, right? I mean, I, I think it's well, track and field, right? I mean, sorry, spring track and field and cross country. It's kind of a crossover. So, yeah. So, all right. Good luck tomorrow in your race and with those that move on to districts and state and all that so thank you very much for inviting us to join you so we wish you the best of luck <laughs> and you're free to go you don't have to stay unless you want to learn about some of the wonderful school improvement plans we have coming up <laughs> All righty, board. Um, as the cross country is leaving, we can go ahead and get ready to go with our business side of the meeting. Um, first up, we have Mount Stewart and the their school improvement plan. Melissa. Good evening, everyone. It's kind of hard to follow the cross country team. <laughs> I'm excited to share uh, briefly with you about some of the things that have happened at Mount Stewart. Again, my name is Melissa, and this is the beginning of my second year um, in Ellensburg. And I am just really grateful to serve um, with uh, Matt Piper, my, my partner here. Uh, nice of him to stay this evening with us. And uh, on the front of the screen is a, a staff photo. Um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be Mount Stewart without those wonderful people who care so much for our kids. Um, and then Matt and I are a little, a little crazy from time to time. Um, the Eagles, you are always welcome to come and visit us there. But I'll walk you through a few things. Uh, we've got a lot of things that we're really proud of. Yep. All right. So here are a few celebrations I just wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, our map growth in math. Um, we were really strong last year in our upper elementary grades, and we're super excited about um, that and bringing up the achievement scores. Um, our students earned over a million Eagle Bucks. You earn Eagle Bucks at Mount Stewart for showing um, school pride and doing the things that you need to do to be a good learner. Um, and then in our building, we have a really detailed way kids can choose to redeem those for cool experiences like a um, you can learn, you could totally come and join this. Um, uh, Taylor Swift dance party routine, you can learn that. You can turn your, your uh, bucks in there or uh, get your fingernails painted. Uh, lots of different choices because our kids have different things that motivate them. Uh, we also had quite a few referrals as part of last school year and found a trend down at the end of the year, which was a delight. Um, and then we just have that constant philosophy of celebrating and looking for things that are going well. Um, we do that with students. We do it with staff. Um, and one highlight from us uh, last year was a staff wellness professional development. We brought in a community member to do some things with our people. And um, some of them shared that that was the best PD they'd ever received. And it was just about kind of centering yourself and being a more purposeful educator, more whole version of yourself. So those are some highlights. Uh, I told you that we had our trends down. Uh, March was a pretty real month for us last year. We had quite a few, it looks like almost seven major referrals a day average. 
It was very busy for us. And we clearly have some trends in specific grade levels. You see at last year's kindergarten cohort, second grade cohort, and fifth grade cohort. So we knew coming into this school year what to uh, plan for and what to be ready for. And then down at the bottom, that's the graph of per month, how many Eagle Bucks were rewarded. We found that we were seeing an increase in negative behavior. So we wanted to have a, a bigger increase in positive rewards for kids doing the right thing. Here's a little bit more information about our academic growth. Uh, again, you saw the average for math growth before at 84, um, 84th percentile. Um, our achievement score in the fall was at 35, and by the end of the year, it was uh, in the 52nd percentile, so that's a really nice growth. And again, that's an average of grades uh, second through fifth. And then in reading, our growth wasn't as strong as we would have hoped. Um, we did have over 50% uh, percentile growth. Um, we went from the 34th in the fall to 37th in the spring. And you'll see this is the data that drove our school improvement plan this year. And then uh, students had a lot of testing at the end of last school year, and we've uh, already discussed as a staff how to prioritize taking which tests and why and, and some of those pieces. But uh, overall, our fifth graders took uh, three tests, but one of they're the only grade level that takes science. 54% um, of our students passed that with a, a score of a three or four on the state test. Um, for ELA in grades three, four, and five, our average was 40% passing, and math was 37% passing. Um, we were not um, really thrilled with these results, and we are uh, making a lot of intentional decisions to move learning forward together. So here's a couple of our goals. Um, we've talked about the behavior referrals. We're going to take those babies down at least 10%. That's our plan. Um, we are going to target specifically in the classroom. And um, physical aggression was our top trend of kids just using their bodies instead of their words to solve their problems. And then also just general disruption. So we do know that um, we have to address those systematically and then continue to reward our students. So these are some of the action plans for us. Uh, as a new to a building, I said, hey, what are we doing? Um, what, what professional development have you had? What are the expectations here? So as a building, we came up with all of those. And so we have a building document that kind of outlines the loose and tight of all of our tier one SEL procedures. So we're going to continue to work on that, um, get in classrooms as much as we can with our school counselor or our long-term sub to do class lessons. Uh, specifically bullying is what we're doing the next couple of weeks, but we have a number of units to cover. And then um, we're piloting a new social-emotional um, screener called the DESA. It is a strength-based SEL screener, so a little different than what we've used in the past. Pretty excited to do that. We're the only building in the district doing it, so we were, we'll let you know how it goes. And then um, we have some student uh, voice goals. We've got a summary of Second Steps, which is our core SEL program um, that goes out each week so families know what we're teaching our kids and how they can help at home. Um, we're sharing attendance information. And for the first time, I don't know if Matt's experienced it, but I've got kids that are like, I need to be in school because they know we're, we're cracking that and sharing it. And so we're like, yeah, you do, go. Um, so pretty excited to have kids. We know want to be at school for a lot of reasons. And then we have a few um, family partnership events coming up too. And again, these are just our tools of how we're tracking this, got a lot of things in place. And uh, to support the plan, many, many steps. Uh, a lot of this is driven by staff inputs. What do we think together that we need and the, the steps that we're gonna take to get there? A lot of time together, uh, working through our data, working through our student needs. Um, we've got master schedule changes that are big systems pieces, uh, updated referrals, and the way we respond to students that are escalated, um, and as much as we can, um, hitting some proactive measures to get in front of things so we can be more proactive than reactive. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna bring it home with our achievement data, just a little bit more above our steps of what we're doing. Uh, we recognize we've got some pretty big gaps in some of our academic data. And so we are um, looking to increase our state assessment scores in math and reading by 7%. 
Uh, we do really want to maintain growth, and that's more captured in our MAP scores. So we want to have it at a minimum um, of the 50th percentile in growth, which I think matters a whole lot for all kids. And then um, we also want to address writing. We recognize the pivotal role that that plays in all learning. Uh, one big way we're addressing this is through our WIN program. WIN stands for what I need. Uh, being really specific about it being skill-based and responsive as, as a goal we've taken on and as a, as a building, uh, working through questions together about what that looks like and how do you know students learn um, doing pre-assessments so you can tell before you even enter a unit um, how students might need support as they move through it. Um, and to do that, it takes a lot of time to make sure you have assessments that are simple, uh, easy to use, and are targeted for kids. Um, so we've been working on doing that together and then also tracking that in some sort of a systematic way so that we're not ever really surprised that our kids are growing. We want to be able to celebrate that and measure that. And if they're not, we want to be able to put our heads together and say, how else can we support them? What else can we do together? So those are some of the steps we've taken. Um, we've also uh, uh, piloting another program called the Youth Light. It's a explicit phonics, like systematic phonics program. Um, it's really direct instruction, very simple for our paraeducators to use. And we think that will really help us um, use their time very well and very systematically to move our kids forward. Um, it's going really well so far. And then finally, one celebration um, about some of the things that we're doing this year, Troy and uh, Jen were in the building today. We've got um, uh, our ML teacher working with our students learning English, and then one of our special education teachers are co-teaching writing, and they're pretty excited about it, and some great things are happening there. Uh, we have a few different uh, projects we're also working on um, to make sure that our families are engaged. We've got people coming in and reading books with our kids. Um, we've got some books that are going home and making sure our families recognize the important role they have in supporting kids reading at home. And then we've got some more events where we're uh, working together with families, trying to figure out how we can better support them and meet their needs. Um, lots of ways to collect information, as I mentioned before. Um, all kinds of different options for staff, and we want them to feel very empowered um, and nimble about making those decisions about their students so that we're always um, able to be flexible and responsive. And then this is just a few more steps of the things that we're taking together um, as we are working with our leadership team to figure out what are the steps that we need to take, what are the holes that we see, what are the skills we need to further develop. So this, these action items are things that we are taking on throughout the course of the school year. So there's a lot that feels a little bit new. Um, we are definitely pushing the envelope on some things. Um, that's sometimes a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I'm really impressed with the... Uh, the caliber of the staff um, at Mount Stewart that they're working together and they're trying some things and we're a little crazy like exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so excited to see the kids uh, have that same success in time this year. It's going to be a great year. So I leave you with this. Uh, this year, as Matt and I were planning for the school year and our kind of hopes and dreams for our staff and families and students. Um, we felt like the thing that we can control the most is our mindset. We feel like you can do anything if you put your mind to it. And we do have some work to do. And um, we feel like we can do it together. So uh, with the right mindset, we can move mountains. And we will. Uh, you again are most welcome to come and visit anytime that you would like to. What questions might you have for me? Well, we have heard directly from teachers about burnout, you know, and we're talking about wellness and mindset and how important that is because all of that will impact the the student learning if the teachers are feeling like they need more support or they are burning out. So the wellness PD you said they thought was great. What do you can you tell us just briefly a couple of the things that that it included? Yeah. Um, I met with a, a gal named Jillian DeBritt, a community member and a Mount Stewart parent. And uh, she does a lot of different life coaching type things. So um, she created a workbook for us to work through where it was mostly journaling. And so she would um, provide some prompts and um, time for us to quietly write 
Um, and it was really powerful because I think people, many of them are at the same phase of life as I am, where you are rushing children to practice and you're racing home to the, get to the grocery store and run those errands and you finally get home and it's nine o'clock and you, you do all to do it again, right? Okay. And so just making some space to be calm and thinking about your dreams and who you want to be and what you want your life to matter. So therefore, what are the small steps you take to get there were some of the things that I think was most beneficial right? Life happens while you're making other plans. And if you don't make plans, it still happens, right? Um, we have seen some changes in our people because of those um, conversations they've had. Any other? This is just a general question, yeah. but on the SEL um, piece, you mentioned tier one, loose and tight. Mm -hmm. Could you just remind me of what that distinction is? Yeah. Um, in our building, we discussed what are all the elements that we would need to have in a high functioning school, like greeting students at the door to make them feel welcome and like they belong. Um, that aside time for teaching social emotional learning, um, clear transitions in the classroom, a visual schedule on the wall, all of those things are elements of, of that. And the, the loose part is how the style and the way the teacher wants to do it. And the tight is that we all believe that's best for kids. All right. Thank you very much, Melissa. You bet. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for all the information. Thanks. All righty, and next up, Ida Nace and Veronica Improvement Plan. Well, while she gets it up, I'm Heather Burfine, otherwise known as Mrs. B, and it's really exciting to see you two up there, because they were at Valley View and I was at Valley View. They're growing up, Tasha. Um, so I am thrilled to be here tonight to just kind of talk a little bit about what we're thinking about this year. Obviously, you know, it's kind of going through a, a transitional year as we change leadership and we kind of see where we need to go in the future. And so, um, let me start off just, just sharing some celebrations that some I can take credit for some, most of them I cannot, but I wanted to share them with you because I think that it's important for you to know where we're going with those as well. So uh just monday we had uh unveiled to the student body the pacific education institute oh it's supposed to say school of the year sorry students i'm i'm good at uh errors in my presentations oh sorry uh, pacific education institute school of the year banner and at the same time we are also recognized by association of washington school principals for the school on the rise and Troy and Leslie got to experience a uh, spirit assembly yesterday, or yesterday, Monday, with our staff. Um, we are continuing our work with the Pocket Forest. We did some new planting, some winterizing today, or this year, uh, last couple of weeks ago. And I got to tell you that if I could just have them outside every day, all day doing that, it was amazing. We had kiddos that maybe didn't want to come in from recess, and so we didn't. We didn't, we picked our battle and they got right into that garden and they were helping and, and the older kids were right in there with them. So the magic that happens in that pocket garden when they're out there working in it is amazing. So uh, we're continuing some of those things, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we just yesterday had the Pacific Science Center here. It was actually really fun. It was a little chaotic in the morning, but we had a big planetarium in here. Um, kids behind the stage could do hands-on um, types of activities and different uh, stations where they were working with the Science Center. So that was a PTO-sponsored event, um, but it was really kind of a cool idea. And they offered uh, the staff to do some uh, Zoom meetings with other staff over at the Science Center to continue their studies on that. Um, PTO, they're super active. <laughs> it's awesome. And so they had a movie night, asked them why they were doing bananas. It had to do with the movie. I wasn't sure. I was a little out of the loop there on that one, but that's okay. Um, we continue, and probably my favorite part of the day is a good news call of the day uh, for our change makers. It's always really awesome for me to say, hi, this is Mrs. Burfine from Ida Nason, and we're calling with the great news of the day. I have to say it really quick because they get a little worried. <laughs> 
Um, but our really exciting news right now uh, is our OSPI outdoor grant for $40,000 that we received just recently was approved and recognized. So we are super excited for that. We're going to make some improvements in our gardens, uh, gardening tools. Um, we're looking at bringing Brenda James back in to do some work with our students again and hoping that they also get a grant. Uh, Grace, our garden manager, has already spent it all. I'm pretty sure I told her she has to meet with me tomorrow, though, to really finalize that piece. So we're pretty excited about the grant. And on a side note, is my first grant I ever wrote. So um, the other area that we've kind of started to develop, and I think we're going to, you will see, continue to develop is a sensory area for SEL. Um, some schools call it a restorative room or a reset room or something like that. We have a sensory area for our students um, by the gracious uh, donation of a kindergarten parent that has turned into an area for all students. And we have it staffed and it's actually starting to really work out. And we ha they have passes, they can come and they can just take a break and then head back to class. And we're seeing success in students just taking a break from the classroom we're monitoring the time. Uh, they're not there all day. They don't get to continually come. And when they get the chance to make a choice to come, do what they need to do, they're so much more receptive to say, okay, my 10 minutes up, I'm heading back. So that has been a really uh, neat addition to what we've done this fall. Scott Robinson has started uh, Walking Running Club technology. He has his scan code. They're out there. They're scanning as they come by. They're getting super excited about the work that they're doing on that as well. Uh, I will show some slides about our commissioned art project um, and talk a little bit about that. And then I just put in the CCE uh, cultural data because when I got here and looked at it, I was like, wow, I don't mess that up or find. <laughs> I was like, woohoo, that's exciting. So, um, and I wasn't able to get you a little snippet of that as I had hoped. This is the uh, Washington State Commission art project that goes through OSPI and the, um, uh, we've got Stephanie Teasley, um, oh my gosh, I'm drawing blanks, of course. Um, the director of Gallery One is on this. Uh, the artist is from Minnesota. Randy Eckert is also on it, myself, um, Sadie Thayer from um, the Historical Museum, and we have been meeting here and there on the project that was commissioned by this artist. Um, all of the art that has a background, like green-ish or the blue, is completed. The other art is in process, and they're mosaics. And some of them are actual designs of Ida Nason. Some of them are inspired from designs she had that were given to her. And then the other ones have to do with the wildlife um, at different seasons. There are 15, no, there's 20 different tiles. These are just a handful of them. And there will be um, four or five per, five per season. Okay. Um, there will be down this hallway. I believe is where we're putting them all. So um, this is also just another celebration and kind of uh, something that we've used as a staff to center ourselves a little bit when we want to think about the work we're doing after a long day. Um, this was taken by a neighbor uh, who sent it to me, who knows me personally and said, hey, look what I just took over your school the other night. I was like, whoa. So I just thought that'd be kind of a nice celebration that just shows that Ida shines. So I want to talk a little bit about the improvement plan first before I go into the data pieces. Um, being new, um, there are multiple different data sources that I am trying to uh, figure out how to use. And so Jen has been most gracious. Um, Jen, I don't know how to get in here. And so she's helped me. Um, but when I started to look at data, there were just three areas that really I saw as a focus coming in new. Um, I also ran this by my uh, building lit team and asked them to participate with me because it wasn't, I didn't feel like I could walk in and say, hey, this is our SIP plan. You guys are going to do it. They've been doing the work. I don't know the um, elementary language assessment language yet, and I needed them, and I also needed it to be their work. 
So um, we, this was one piece of data that we've used, um, just kind of says it right there in terms of the percentage with our um, ELA, specifically writing. So that's one piece that's in, uh, is what we use to inform our plan. This was the other one that just kind of re um, shows that data a little bit to show um, how we're and where we are in the, the third, fourth, and fifth grade writing piece. Um, as I talk about this, you we have had numerous conversations as a staff about the writing. Um, and it's a little bit of my background, but also it's just something that they have really picked up and want to work on. So that's been exciting for me. Um, and then the, the, the behavior piece was one that I took a look at. Um, Rhonda had given me all the the. the the Swiss data, and I just kind of picked one out as a an example, that we've continued to increase in the behavior um, for whatever reason. And um, just last year at this time, well, in September, there were 36, and this year we had 91. So we've got some work, and that will be, you'll see in the plan that we're going to be working on here in the next couple months. Uh, I put all the goals right there together. We're going to be working on um, the ELA assessment SBAC from a 36% to a 43% in the three grades. Um, our lower class grades are also working towards that for the future in terms of some of the work they're doing in their PLCs. Um, the other academic goal is increasing that proficiency in narrative opinion and informative writing from less than 30% to over 40% proficient in the SBAC. I just want to see it go. Um, my staff would like to see these numbers move a little smaller. I'm like, oh, heck no, go bigger, go, go home. So we're going to try. So uh, we're looking for some growth. Um, the social emotional goal is going to be hopefully that we will reflect a decrease in students' major behaviors from 51 to 45%. And when we talk about major behaviors, we're talking about aggressive behaviors, destruction, and what we would call major versus minor behaviors. Okay. Uh, some of the ways that we're gonna be looking at our, our monitoring of those will be our maps, our mass assessments, cognitive formative assessments, interim assessments. Um, we're starting some of that now. Uh, so the writing piece, we're working on that scope and sequence. Uh, doing the interim. The other piece that we're looking at too is how we integrate writing all the way across the curriculum. And that's a lot of the conversations we're having right now. And we're monitoring through the benchmarks that you see there. Um, the work sample, or excuse me, the student reflection is not, it's not really reflective of what we're doing already. We're asking, and I'm really pushing student voice. I want to know what students how they participate, and I was really excited to be in an observation um, today where the teacher was having the kids develop their own rubric for writing. I've been in other observations where I've heard the teacher say, well, we're doing social studies, but remember, we're going to be doing writing as part of social studies, because what is our goal this year? Writing. And so we're. I'm hearing a lot of our work um, I'm hearing a lot of my words actually coming out and teachers grabbing it and wanting to go with it. Uh, so with our SEL goal, our said would be just our Swiss data is really going to be our big our big tell. Um, and then we do use the SRSS monthly screening data um, information, and I'm just getting familiar with that. Um, and so is our counselor. We just did our first round of it, so we're getting some of the results back now. Uh, okay, and so again, some of the things... We've talked about, Melissa's talked about our win time, um, but our tier one academic practices in all areas really is what I want to look at. But right now we're looking at our ELA, but also it'll come up in, in writing. Um, also looking at specific units of study for our instructional growth cycles and completing those processes. And I really want the staff to get into the practice of doing that so that we can see if what we're trying to do is effective. We hope to have some uh, literacy nights, scholastic book uh, fair. We have some partnerships with Central. I'm super impressed with our student teachers and practicum students that are coming in right now. Um, so that's been helpful. Uh, again, implementing intentional scheduling for dedicated writing. I even heard it again today in our BLIT that we really need to, the, the comment was writing tends to be last. And so we wanna make it first. 
um, work with our ML specialists to provide writing support and uh, work on our instructional growth cycles for that. The other piece, <laughs> I'm kind of feeling a little spoiled because when I said, you know, when you do your student growth goals, if you invite your parents to be part of it, and they all did. So, <laughs> I'm really excited to hear that they're starting to involve parents with the writing rubrics and sitting at home. Uh, and so that was kind of fun to hear uh, in that piece of it. The big piece for me right now in terms of focus is, is on that SAB goal. We will be taking some time this week to really dig into our PBIS framework and look at what we have, what's working, what's not working, what we need to adjust. Um, really look at our data that we have from Swiss and our SRSS data to make sure that we are making some structural system and ph philosophical changes, but we can really focus on what our students need in the behavior area. Um, and again, I think we're looking at second steps, uh, regular tips. I'm trying to send things out regularly. Um, and then I'm looking at trying to do a parent parenting night in the future and trying to incorporate some of those things. Um, but for me right now, IDO has been here for two years, and now it's time to kind of look at this, where we're at and tweak some things and make it even that much stronger. So supporting the plan is our interim testing, time at PLCs, grade level instructional uh, growth cycles, exploration of data, um, staff retreats to look at our PBIS. Um, pretty self-explanatory in terms of what we wanna do. And pretty simple for me right now in terms of where we're at because just don't wanna take on more than we can handle. Questions? Board, any questions for Heather? Or, no? All right. I think you're off the hook. Thank you very much, Heather. <laughs> All righty. Next up is Haley. Hello. And the Choice Schools. Perfect. Uh, while she's getting my stuff, I'm, ha oh, I'm Haley Nevoychik. Uh, this is my second year as the principal of the Choice Schools. And... Thanks for having me. Okay, we're ready. Yeah. Uh, so this is our uh, improvement plan. You'll notice that our logo, uh, we're working on, we're gonna share about that. That's our first celebration. So um, our first project this year was uh, around picking a school mascot. So really talking about uh, what's the culture we wanna build uh, as a school. This is the second year as the big picture program. Uh, what does it mean to be a school? What, is it, what, what does that look like? Um, and so the end product of our project was picking a mascot. The mascot that students picked and voted for was the book. Uh, so the deer buck. Uh, the my favorite reason to pick the buck is that they are lively, energetic, and sometimes reckless in nature. Uh, but other positive um, and really genuinely uh, good reasons and symbolic reasons to pick the buck. Uh, the regeneration uh, of antlers each year, you know, out with the old, in with the new in the spring. The idea that. Uh, you know, shedding dead weight uh, was positive. And then the deer represents growth, peace, kindness, and compassion, which are all skills we're working on on a daily basis in our neck of the woods. Um, so it was really, it was cool though to see the variety of, um, from elephants to frogs. Uh, of course, the phoenix was a popular uh, choice from kids, but really to hear the reasoning behind why they picked that mascot. And, and it was re pretty representative of their journeys through school and what they're hoping for from, uh, from our program and from their education. Uh, another really positive thing that we have going on right now is student internships and uh, partnerships in our community. 30 of our 55 kids either are regularly going to a job or an internship or have done a job shadow uh, already. 
We have a field trip planned to Old Mill next week, Anderson Hay and Grain in two weeks. Uh, kids are working from hay companies, hair salons, uh, a couple are in the kitchen at EHS, they're in the life skills classroom. Uh, and so we're starting to see the, uh, the idea come to life of kids leaving the classroom and learning away from, away from the building. Uh, staff training and projects, uh, SEL and AI, we have done some really intentional work as a staff to learn um, how, to, how to plan a project. Uh, it is a very awesome idea when you say we're doing project learning. It is hard, hard work, and it requires intentional steps, intentional planning, um, that mascot project, it, it swerved a little bit from time to time, and we learned a lot from that. Uh, really identifying what we want kids to know and be able to do at the end of this, what it looks like, um, and how do we do that across three classrooms with three staff members at and, and land the plane at the same time. Um, and so uh, they have been gracious in learning, in, you know, doing all the things we ask kids to do, to, to try something, to have it not go the way you plan, to come back and, and do it again. Um, we met with Joel Boast and did some AI stuff, some cool things you can plug into AI for staff to have more time. Um, you know, the ideas that are generated from that are pretty impressive. Opportunities for students to learn about different jobs and it, it, the opportunities are endless. Uh, we just scratched the surface, but some cool, um, good stuff came out of those things. And then systems, systems, systems. My Facebook feed right now, about once a day, I see the bad systems kill good people every time. And, and I have really good people. And so we have to have better systems. Um, we have worked on our attendance. Like, first of all, we actually have accurate attendance this year, which is new. Um, we have internship tracking that, you know, when a kid's leaving, where are they going? Are they, where are they supposed to be? Um, the placement of who's taking kids, are they rotating, you know, uh, that internship piece has been a major monster to tackle. Um, we share kids with Ellensburg High School, the data entry that is required for that um, and the communication is significant and is starting to have uh, better systems in place for how our online kids are enrolled, what that process looks like. Um, so really like we have a schedule and we've stuck to it since September 9th. So like in and of itself, that's a major system change for us. Uh, and so really celebrating that we are starting to to look like a real school and doing doing stuff and, and relieving some stress uh, for people in our system, so. All right, so our data, um, it, it is hard to find consistent sources of data for us um, it, because of the nature of kind of where we are and what we've been, it, it's a little bit difficult. So SBA data is a pretty, pretty consistent measure. Um, you will notice, you can go to the next one. There's a lot of red. Uh, but there's a couple of spots of yellow here that are, um, you, you can go to the next one. Yeah, no, uh, and the next one. Oh. Uh, but there's also a couple of pockets of yellow. Um, and then you can go to the next. Our ELA trend is a little more positive, uh, considerably more yellow and there's green which is uh, students actually are performing at proficiency. So next, I uh, think this is some of the stuff that I think is most interesting to me. Um, I think there's an assumption that kids just don't wanna come to school when you're in the alternative programs. Um, 
when you talk to kids, it's actually not that. It's that they don't find it super engaging. They don't know why they need to be there. Why do I have to learn that? Uh, and if you're not academically confident, the intervention piece, if you don't feel like you're gonna get help, if you're not 100% sure how to do that, um, it makes it really hard to be excited to come to school. So uh, these CEE survey pieces, um, you know, those light colors in the blue are areas that we can turn around. And so there's a lot of potential for us. And again, same, um, you know, some interesting feedback from kids and families. Okay. And then uh, MAPS growth, there's been, uh, as far as growth and percentiles of achievement, um, we saw kids doing better on tests and they were super interested in that over the, you know, um, what does that score mean? Uh, and so uh, that's our, that's math. And the next one is ELA or reading. Okay. So that's sort of the data we looked at uh, when it comes to our goals. 100% uh, of students are going to demonstrate growth in their maths, maps testing. Um, last year, like there were pockets of improvement and it was very it just happened, right? Like with intentional work, intentional focus and intentional like direction, we believe 100% of students are gonna grow. For those of you who like flowchart goals where you have to kind of think about what the goals are, 75% uh, of students achieving at least the 60th percentile in MAPS growth, which is an, would be an increase from 50%. And then improving ELA outcomes uh, by 50% of students achieving at least the 60th percentile, which is would be up from 30%. As far as our social emotional behavioral goal, uh, increasing our regular attendance so that kids are coming 80% of the time or more. Uh, things we're doing to monitor that uh, in the academics, maps, Exhibitions are student presentations of their work. So their academic uh, project in their morning classes, their personal project in their afternoon time, and then an explanation of their internship, job shadow, uh, leading to learn experiences. Uh, so presenting that to their teachers, classmates, uh, parents, uh, the student end of unit projects. So each unit, that we're doing in the mornings is a uh, going to be you know a major benchmark as far as how they're progressing with uh, progress monitoring our checkpoints and assessments within the unit uh, students are tracking and evaluating their own goals each week their writing goals uh, rating themselves and reflecting on what they're doing and then as part of ALE, our monthly progress reports uh, are also good progress monitoring. For our social emotional behavioral goal, the uh, attendance checks and celebrating attendance. Um, at least once a week, I talk to a student about their attendance and I'm like, you missed, you know, X amount of days. And they're like, I know, isn't that amazing? I'm doing so good. And I'm like, wow, that's not how I can <laughs> um, so, so, and when you call home, they're like, yeah, she comes to school more than ever before. And it's like, okay, so how do we celebrate what they have accomplished and that they're happy while still encouraging, let's try adding one more day. Um, and so trying to find uh, better ways to celebrate, not just always harass them about it. Uh, progress monitoring for that goal. We have a CEE, uh, we stole some of the questions from the survey and uh, are sending that out 
about every six weeks to kids. So it's about to go out again, just to know how they're feeling at school. Um, do they feel like the work they're doing is relevant? It, are the things we know are important to them? How do they feel uh, instead of waiting for the yearly survey to happen? Uh, parents where we're, we get good two-way communication in parents where, um, so hearing what parents have to say about what we're doing, attendance, getting their feedback, uh, Skyward, obviously, for attendance information, and then looking at our discipline data, you know, time in the morning versus time in the afternoon, uh, days where there's more kids there because they're, you know, who, who are the kids that are together? What's going on? Um, and so really being able to try to figure out when there's an issue um, and if kids don't feel like they want to be at school. Okay, uh, the academic instructional practices, we're gonna continue to do professional development around our project planning. Um, we're really, uh, our second project, I am super proud of the staff and what they are doing. They each picked an element of their competency. They knew what that needed to look like. And then knowing their piece of the puzzle, we came together uh, and they're doing a project on uh, so it's about theme and graphic representation and dependent and independent variables. And so kids are tracking their heart rate uh, with heart rate monitors as different genres of music plays. And then they have to graphically present uh, the best music for workout, studying, um, and show us what does that mean? And so... Uh, it's a big lift to get there. It sounds super cool, but there's a lot of moving parts to make that happen. Um, and what are the checkpoints along the way that we make sure that they do understand how to graphically represent data? Uh, using our comp big picture competencies more, kids are graduating based on competency. They need to understand what that means, and so do we, uh, and we need to talk about it consistently. Uh, assessing student work and knowing what do they, you know, what did they learn? What do they know? Uh, we looked today at the first project rubric and it's like, this was a good start, but we're not sure what they learned. How do we get more information out of them? Um, intentionally including students and in looking at their scores. Uh, they're curious. Uh, they want to know what that SBA score means. What does that map? What does that mean? What did I do last time? How do you like, how do I get better? Uh, well, you come and remember that when you told me about your attendance, that's where we start. Uh, but, you know, they they want to know. Uh, and then consistently communicating high expectations and celebrating achievement. Um, I am a party planner. Like celebrating should be the easy thing, right? And we haven't been, we haven't done that. So uh, as far as our sub goal, Defining our essential tier one PBIS practices um, when there's only three classrooms and one hallway, when those are not clear and consistent, everyone in the whole space knows. Um, and so really getting specific about what are the behavior expectations and what are we like, what are we doing to teach them and how are we handling them when we don't see what we want? Uh, regularly co collecting data, again, from students using those CEE questions. We're using circle time, advisory time, uh, relationship strategies, and really trying to look at assets and student assets first, uh, and then addressing needs and challenges. Getting those kids those internships, it's the coolest thing ever. They come in a totally different kid because they see value in themselves uh, in a way that sometimes they don't in school. So, and then uh, I think an important sub practice is that we are doing grade level curriculum and kids feel like what they are learning is relevant. It's where they're supposed to be and, and they're they're on track with their peers in a different way. All right, so academic process goals, uh, again, project assessment tracker, 
uh, we're, we're keeping track of what the assessments are and how they're doing on them uh, and reviewing unit by unit how kids are doing. Uh, as far as this like student family voice, monitoring and reflecting on the implementation of our strategies and seeing how staff or families and students feel about what's happening in the classroom. Um, are they seeing improvement? Are they seeing growth? Are they, our families are engaged and want their, you know, um, they've advocated for their kids to be with us. So they want to know how their kids are doing. As far as our sub process goals, uh, engaging in relevant classroom lessons, that real world connection is critically important, grade level curriculum. Um, that's it, grade level curriculum, that's it. Uh, this family voice, student family voice, uh, we're using Parent Square, we're inviting families in, uh, we're talking, you know, we're sending communication out about this is what happened, this is the competency that we saw, this is, um, so it, you know, being more intentional with our communication around what we are doing, what it looks like, because um, competencies are a foreign that, that's not the language we grew up with. And so helping families see what that looks like. Supporting the plan, uh, again, regular communication, um, being more intentional with what we are communicating, making sure families feel like they're uh, included and in attending, uh, having students excited to share their work. Um, making sure we're having multiple opportunities for families to be in our space, having meaningful celebrations related to academic and, and other achievement um, and reg just checking in, like that's still the best part, uh, talking to kids and hearing how things are going. Uh, as far as student and family things, again, communication, better intervention systems. And this is one of those, uh, it has been so nice to have somebody who understands Skyward, can run an attendance report. It's actually accurate and be able to call home and find out what is happening um, before we get to the quarter and we haven't seen them all year. And then the idea of monitoring and reflecting on is what we're doing working um, and really you know, emphasizing that process of not just doing and doing again and doing again, but taking time to stop and think you know, and talk about what worked and what didn't. So for not just us, but families as well. Any questions? Well, I, you might not have an answer for this and that's okay if you don't, but you may have also thought it through, but the internships are so crucial to the students, so wonderful, and they empower them. And I'm just wondering, you know, the businesses are, um, it, it's a lot of work for the business too, to for take sure. on uh, high school yeah, students. And it's so terrifying. What, right. What ways are we recognizing the businesses? When we were at Highline, they did a like intern appreciation dinner. We should, we could do that. But I haven't thought about it, but you're right. Like the recognition to them is absolutely something we need to do. Yeah. So, and we've talked uh, about inviting businesses in to like, bring, you know, instead of, uh, the tour thing is great, but it's often, I think, hard for kids, like, cool. <laughs> uh, but really like bring in an engine, like bring in a birdhouse kit, like bring in a cash register and let it like, um, and so we're trying to reach out to businesses to say, like, what could you bring in? Like, I'll pay for the supplies or whatever, like whatever we need to do. But really, so every kid has the chance to swing a hammer and build a birdhouse. Like, and some of them are going to hate every minute of it, but um, some might actually like it, you know. So, uh, yeah, but finding other ways that aren't, I mean, it's a... Uh, as a business owner, it's a risk to have a 16 well, year old or younger. I mean, and I just and, want to say how I, I know that that's a tremendous amount of work to put into that, but also those connections and those relationships and the skills that the students learn is just huge and important and wonderful for them. So thank you. Yeah. For yeah. I 
I think this is the eighth school improvement plan we've heard. <laughs> ninth? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, ninth. I lost count. Um, but I think for the choice schools, this question of how do you monitor attendance and behavioral issues when students are outside of your building? Right. I'm I'm just curious yeah. how that happens. Like, how much communication is there with um, the supervisors of internships that like helps fill in that piece of social emotional behavior? Um, every student is told that they are to ex you know follow the expectations. I think most of them actually really like uh, expectations that aren't in class, uh, and employers know like fire them, right? Like this is the best time to fire a student so we can talk about it. Um, obviously, no, it's my skeleton's down. Um, but just, we have not had an issue yet, uh, but we are having a conversation with the employer, you know, here's our expectations and what they've been told. Uh, they need to follow your expectations. And if they, you know, hopefully we don't just go straight to you're fired, um, you know, but if we need to have a conversation about being on time, appropriate work, you know, um, we're, we're trying to preempt that, but that doesn't mean that it won't come up. Um, so, so trying to make it as real as possible because, you know, they should understand what the expectation is but as far as we have kind of at this point we're going with a quarterly like actual evaluation um so we have not seen anything yet as far as a formal evaluation i was just thinking that maybe in terms of aspiration not something that i would expect immediately but just that there are a lot of business owners who don't have the pedagogical training that yeah you all have and so sharing some knowledge about not just here's the expectation but here's how to handle it if that expectation has not been met yeah 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 so and i i mean i anticipate we will have a a meeting you know uh at some point with a student and a parent and an employer uh to kind of address a problem um and working through that with the kid will be part of our definitely part of our role Board, any other questions for Haley? Yes, no questions. All right. Thank you very much, Haley. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. So this will take us into financial report next. So um, Melissa and Matt and Haley and Heather, thank you guys very much. But if you want to go home, you may. Thank you. <laughs> can we go with you no um all right so next up is kim and the financial report good evening um tonight we're going through the september 2024 financial update um we are one month into our 24 25 school year and we are pretty much on target um, we're at 6.63% 6 of budgeted revenue and 8.28% 8 .8 of budgeted expenditures. Um, the fund balance is sitting at 12.2. Um, that might change a little bit, still closing out the 23-24 school year. But, um, for the month of September, the district spent uh, 2.2 million for certificated employee salaries. 661,000 for classified employee salaries and 1.03 million for benefits. 269,000 were um, spent on supplies and 1.09 million on professional services. This includes our great insurance um, bill that we had to pay this month for $869,000. Um, $16 on travel and zero um, dollars on capital items this month for a total of $5.08 million. Um, there was no discrepancies between Kittitas County Treasurer's Report and the district trial balance. The capital project fund is showing 1.21% of revenue has been received and 0% of expenditures um, for the month of September. And the fund balance comes in at 1.86 million. There was no discrepancy between Kittitas County Treasurer and the trial balance. 
The debt service fund has received 1.9% of revenues and have 0% of expenditures. Our first expenditures out of that will be in December. Um, the fund balance comes in at 3.3 million and there were no discrepancies um, between KTAS County Treasurer and our trial balance. The ASB fund has received 14.9% of revenues and 1.65% of expenditures have been reported. The fund balance comes in at 589,000 and there was no discrepancy between Kajas County Treasurer and the trial balance. And our private purpose fund is a fiduciary fund. There is not a budget status report, but the fund balance is at approximately 33,849,000. ,000. There were no discrepancies between Kajas County Treasurer and the trial balance. And our transportation vehicle fund, the revenue for this fund came in at 0.53% and 0% expenditures. The fund balance is at 921000 and there were no discrepancies between Kittitas County Treasurers and the trial balance. I'd like to remind everyone that this report is presented with the information I have currently and is subject to change as we continue through the year. I'd also like to remind everyone that revenue sources are used in their current funds for authorized expenditures and can't usually be transferred to be used in different funds unless authorized within the adopted budget and within the accounting laws. And are there any questions? I just had a quick question about clarifying. So when Troy is talking about MSOC costs, those would be included in supplies and professional services. Yes. Is that those two categories? Supplies and professional services and travel and capital. Okay. And he did say nine different other areas. So like in professional services, there's other areas in that okay. within that. Board, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Kim, for the update. Next up is the enrollment report. Yep, the enrollment report. So we had October count, which is uh, you know our, our most important count of the year because that sets the first uh, series of apportionments, and then they make an adjustment later as it goes on. So uh, with three thousand one hundred ninety three point eight nine FTE uh, in October, that puts us um, thirty six point eight nine students over our budgeted. Uh, amount. So that's a good start, knowing that generally speaking throughout the school year, um, your October count is your highest. So um, that's a nice cushion for us. So we'll see see where we go from here. Or any questions or discussion over enrollment report? All right. Thank you very much, Troy. All right, board, next up is resolution 11024, unclaimed property. This is a resolution that we have to do every year. Um, this is unclaimed property. And basically what that means is that any um, payroll checks or any vendor checks that were not cashed or lost, um, we try to contact those people and let them know that they have an outstanding check now still and um, they have not cashed it. And once, um, if they don't respond back to our, we send out like three letters and we try to really get a hold of them and let them know, and then they can come in and we can reissue a check if they have lost it. Um, but once we do all that and they haven't responded to us, then we send it to the state. And so this resolution is just authorizing us to send that amount to the state. And then they can go through the state if they want to claim it later. Board, any questions about this? It is an action item. I move that we approve the unclaimed property resolution 2024. I'll second. Cindy has moved that we approve the unclaimed property resolution I'm going to clarify 01024. Um, and Kathy has seconded. Board, any discussion? Call a vote. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Resolution 11024, unclaimed property, has passed. Next up is resolution. 
two, ten, and twenty-four. Certif uh, levy certification. This resolution is so that we can actually collect our um, levy taxes um, in 2025. We have to go through a resolution to be able to do that. These numbers on this uh, matches our um, our budget for 24-25 that you guys um, adopted back in August. And so this is just what's something that we have to be we have to have authorization to be able to do that. So each year we bring this to you, and we have to send it to um, the county after it's authorized. Yes, please. I'll move that we approve the 2025 levy certification resolution. I'll second. Kathy has moved that we approve the 2025 levy certification. Tasha has seconded. Board, any discussion? Okay, call a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Uh, resolution 210-24-2025 levy certification has passed. We do not have any policy tonight, board. That takes us into board reports. Tasha, do you have a legislative report? No, I do not have a board report either. So board, that now takes us into, well, I'll quickly ask, did anybody go into any last minute uh, since we discussed that this would be the time. Uh, no, uh, but I did go to the women's soccer game and we beat Sela and I liked that and I just want to say that I like <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> I know, I think they just posted their bracket. So they're coming up with their playoffs. Yeah, Number two. Very cool. Uh, okay, that takes us into public comment and... Leslie, if you'll get us. Uh, we do not have anybody in person currently. And if there's anybody on Zoom that wishes to be signed up for uh, public comment, you would need to sign up in the chat box. Um, or if you can't, show that you're raising your hand with the emoji. And we'll give it just a second to see if anybody wants to sign up online. All right, I'll go ahead and close public comment for the night. Thank you. And board that now takes us into new business. Do we have any new business? Okay, all shaking heads no. Everybody's done talking. Uh, that takes us into meeting closing. I asked Troy, we do not have an executive, executive session tonight. Um, so that takes us to board calendar. Um, we have our work study session this Friday, I believe it's at nine. And where are we going again? We're at the chamber office. We'll be at the chamber office on Main Street. So we'll see everybody there. Anything else for board calendar? All right, okay. clarification and next steps. Everybody's done. <laughs> Leslie, do we have signing of official documents tonight? I figured so, thank you. Board, if there's nothing else, I will adjourn. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great night.